This podcast contains discussions on sexual misconduct. Topics such as sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment may be discussed. Listener discretion is advised, and we encourage self-care and seeking professional support as needed. The whole process from encouraging the person who has been victimized to speak up to finding ways to uncover evidence uh, around it and you know corroborate the story or dispel it because our job is not to prove the cases that come the allegations that come before us our job is to collect the evidence that proves or disproves in this episode i have the opportunity to speak to lisa mcclennan director of internal oversight services ios in who her office is tasked with conducting various investigations such as those related to sexual misconduct and internal audits she provides insight into the intricacies and obstacles inherent in conducting these investigations as well as the resilience demonstrated by victims and survivors who often carry the burden throughout the process we call them substantiated or unsubstantiated allegations substantiated meaning that we proved them unsubstantiated meaning that we didn't prove them and unsubstantiated allegation doesn't mean that it didn't happen it simply means that we weren't able to prove it she highlights the sad reality that the lack of evidence may leave the perpetrator unpunished however she remains optimistic that justice can prevail by encouraging bystanders witnesses and colleagues to come forward and speak up so it's not enough for me to be responsible for my own behavior and to be upstanding and uphold the WHO code of conduct but it's also important for me to keep an eye out for my fellow colleagues and if there's something that I'm seeing that is not right doesn't feel right doesn't smell right doesn't look right to address it head on This is the hashtag No Excuse podcast. We discuss the challenges, complexities, and potential solution in preventing and responding to sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment in the humanitarian and development sectors. You'll hear interviews with victims and survivors, experts, aid workers, artists, and leaders. The podcast is produced by the World Health Organization's Department for the Prevention and Response to Sexual Misconduct. I am Guni Dias. your host and global prs network coordinator for the department welcome lisa mcclennan to whos hashtag no excuse podcast thank you thank you it is wonderful to be here thank you for having me so as you know in this podcast we we discuss the nuances around sexual misconduct committed by aid workers so not only do we remove the taboo around the subject but it also helps us to learn together and when i say together it's internally to who within the aid sector and it's also a way for us to navigate a topic that sometimes come across as too complex to address and i think investigation especially for sexual misconduct are one of those sticky topics and as the director of the internal oversight services department which you conduct all investigation and including sexual misconduct could you help us understand what your department does and how it connects to the prevention and respond to sexual misconduct so the office of internal oversight services conducts audits and investigations and that's one part of the comprehensive accountability system and function that not only WHO and other UN agencies but any large organization that provides a, a good or service has to have to have an audit function ensures for stakeholders in the private sector and the public sector and particularly with WHO it provides assurance to the member states that WHO is not only doing what it is supposed to do but it is utilizing the resources in the manner in which the stakeholders or the member states ask so we conduct audits and those audits provide assurance they identify or examine issues before they become problems and then we also do investigations and investigations takes a look at things after they're reported as allegations of wrongdoing and we really just pull the the carpet up take a look underneath things to to determine if whatever the allegation is 
is true and that's fact driven. So we collect evidence to determine if the allegation is true. And then we document that in a report. So there are audit reports, there are investigative reports, and all of that is a part of the accountability system within WHO. How is iOS interconnected with the Department of Prevention and Response to Sexual Misconduct? What I would say about that is that we have to work hand in hand with prevention because part of our work is preventive. And what I mean by that is that you know, audits examine things before they become problems. So by looking at the controls and whether or not those controls are in place, that is a preventive measure in and of itself. And when you take a look at investigations and you, you realize that the outcomes of in investigations, when those uh, matters are proven to be true, there are consequences for that. And those consequences serve as a deterrent. So it also prevents things from future misconduct from happening. And we make notifications to, to the stakeholders, you know, to so for example, we make sure that you have the information that you need when you have to talk to the country office. Uh, and I don't mean the intricate details of an investigation. I mean the higher level information such as there is a, an ongoing investigation or there have been allegations of sexual misconduct rep reported in this place or in that place. And those notifications also include the UN resident, um, resident coordinator. And since your arrival at WHO in late 2022, I think only if you're internal to WHO, you would know this. You've been instrumental in changing how WHO addresses uh, sexual misconduct. You scaled up the organization's capacity to conduct investigation into sexual misconduct, changing procedures, setting benchmark, and attacking the backlog of cases you inherited. What have you learned in the past two years? And have you noticed any trends or emerging issues that you've noticed? What I'll say about what I learned and something I didn't know is that WHO really is an awesome place to work. I would say that I have been reminded of several other things, and that is that dignity and respect go hand in hand. It is not for anyone to take liberties that don't belong to them. Something else that I'm reminded of is that culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So having some of the work that we are now doing uh, on, on culture is so apropos because it doesn't really matter what our technical strategy is. We will continue to sit in the problem that we experienced as a result of the 10th Ebola outbreak from you know, 2018 through, I would say, about 2022, 2023 unless we do something about our culture. And then the last thing that I would say or have been reminded of over the last two years is that people don't always deliver on what is expected of them, but they really lean heavily into what you inspect. So it's not so much the expectations, it's more about the inspection, which is why it's so important for, for iOS to exist and to be robust and to work as hand in hand with the the rest of the accountability functions, but also to be considered within the organization a thought partner to help to help resolve issues and also a trusted advisor. You know, the workforce is learning at this point what can be or what should be reported. We went from a period or a place in our de development as an organization of what many have argued it was impunity, where there were it was taboo or difficult to talk about wrongdoing and misconduct, to opening up the floodgates and people having an understanding that that iOS does care, that there is some accountability in the office, and that although we have a lot of work to do, things can be done when there is a problem. And opening up those floodgates caused us to go from very few things being reported to so many things being reported, and some of the things that are reported don't require iOS uh, intervention. I believe that I call it the, the the violent swing of the pendulum. And I think that while the pendulum has swung in one direction from no reporting to reporting everything, the more we work with our culture and the more we lean into behavioral change, the greater the understanding will be what can be resolved at the management level, what is it that requires uh, investigative resources? So, you know, the, the trend has been certainly the volume of reporting and increasing 
meaning that we're still working towards it understanding of what is appropriate to uh, to report. We actually went for a culture of a fear of reporting to people who are feeling a sense of trust that has increased and maybe potentially reporting things that could have been managed in a different way. And is this where we are at right now, figuring out, providing clear guidance on what is to be reported? Is that where we're at? So I think that we are in between stages. We went from late 2021 to probably late 2022, moving out of that fear-based stage. Like, there's no reason for me to report. If I report, I'm going to be harmed. Greater harm is going to come to me for shining a light on something to... I don't have to deal with anything. We just send it to iOS and they will figure out how to deal with that. And right now the office is in in constant talks with the other accountability partners to raise the awareness and to put in some guidelines around what is expected of management slash leadership. What are some of the other, what I would call resolution avenues such as uh, ombudsman, such as HR, you know, if there's something related to a, a medical issue, iOS probably can't do much to resolve that. That's really more of a staff health and, and wellness issue. So what, what are the various avenues? And I think that we are, as an organization, well on our way to putting the guidance in place. We don't want to manage the organization by investigations. You have extensive experience working in law enforcement, organizational change, and you've been in various leadership roles. How is addressing sexual misconduct in a UN agency similar or different to your past experiences? It is a bit different than some of my past experiences. So I'm not talking about the mechanics of investigating. The fundamental issue is that in my past, the majority of my work has been criminal in nature. So I've investigated crimes that had investigations that were adjudicated. There were outcomes. People went to jail. There were fines in civil cases. Everything that we deal with here at WHO is administrative in nature, even though it may be a crime, especially as it relates to sexual misconduct, could be a crime in the jurisdiction in which it was committed. But as IOS, we have nothing to do with providing that information to those those who will prosecute it. In my role here, I, I don't have anything to do with, with carrying out what I would call the external justice system. Something that I would say is more of a heart issue for me is that, yes, I've dealt in my past, I've dealt with impoverished people, other people that we would consider disenfranchised populations. When it comes to the humanitarian sector, there is vulnerability that teeters on the brink of desperation. And to be in an environment where we are asked to help the most vulnerable, yet find ourselves trying to understand how we hurt the population rather than to help them becomes a very difficult issue to swallow. And it begs the question, what went wrong? And why are we in this situation? Why are we taking liberties that don't belong to us when what we are there for is to provide relief in in terms of you know improving health outcomes to these most vulnerable populations? I liken it to being in a ring, in a boxing ring. You only step into a ring to box when you have a contender. You don't put a 40-year-old heavyweight against a newborn because the odds are just so stacked against one side that there's there's no benefit to to doing that. There's nothing good that could come from that. And so, you know, the the idea that someone is vulnerable to the point of being desperate and continues to be taken advantage of particularly by those who are put in place to to help them uh, becomes a, a, an issue difficult to swallow even when you're in a position to try to uncover what went wrong. What would you say is the biggest challenge taking for example this example where you are dealing with two parties that in terms of power or even agency 
What is the biggest challenge in an investigation of sexual misconduct as an investigator? Sexual misconduct is an objectification of a person, and it it has the a great potential to strip them of their dignity. So there are so much psychosocial trauma that happens in these instances that to get to the bottom of the incident itself, just the reporting of it can be difficult because there are so many layers that have to be peeled back just to get to it. There is also still, unfortunately, victim blaming. There is a lot of thought that goes into the social repercussions of reporting it. And an investigation, whether an investigation takes a couple of months or, or sl- only slightly longer, that is a long time to determine or to wait for what the outcome of what you have reported uh, will be. So the whole process from the encouraging the person who has been victimized to speak up to finding ways to uncover evidence uh, around it and you know corroborate the story or dispel it because our job is not to prove the allegations that come before us our job is to collect the evidence that proves or disproves however when someone has been a victim of of sexual misconduct it just becomes a difficult thing because of the psychosocial trauma that the person likely has endured the fact that there are likely no witnesses and the interviews of the survivor the medical staff if they are available witnesses become critical to proving or disproving these types of allegations. And sometimes we're able to prove them. Sometimes we are not able to prove them. We call them in in this world, we call them substantiated or unsubstantiated allegations. Substantiated meaning that we proved them. Unsubstantiated meaning that we didn't prove them. And unsubstantiated allegation doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It simply means that we weren't able to prove it. And that goes back to the difficulty with the evidence collection. So this brings me to, you know, the victim and survivor-centered approach. In UN agencies like WHO, we want to apply a victim and survivor-centered approach to investigating allegation of sexual misconduct. But in the principle, knowing that there's two agents that are alleged at this point. How do you approach this in in your work? We don't approach this work with an agenda. We don't approach this work with a preconceived notion of an outcome. But understanding, you know, the the victim slash survivor-centered approach is understanding what the person needs to move forward. This is to understand whether or not the person making the report is safe. Does the person feel safe? What are the things that the person needs to feel safe, to be okay? Is there medical attention that's needed? Once we ensure that there is both physical and psychological safety, it's about really embarking upon the principle of listening, approaching the survivor with empathy, asking the questions, being empathetic and sympathetic in both the asking and the clarifications that are going to be required, and continuously checking in with the survivor to make sure that are we still okay? Can we continue to to move forward? The continued communication throughout the process. So if the survivor says, yes, I want to move forward, and there are multiple stages to the investigation, one of the things that is important is that they are able to maintain agency. And in the victim and survivor-centered approach, the maintaining of agency really has to do with their right to participate in an investigative process or not. And then there is the other side, which is not in competition with or in contravention of, but it is making sure that in our victim and survivor-centered approach, that we do whatever we can to also ensure that WHO does not become the victim of continued misconduct by, by a perpetrator meaning that we ensure that the organization maintains its duty of care to others who could become potential victims. And so we will still ask questions around, you know, after we get through the basics, around what happened, where did these things happen, how did this happen, what were the circumstances under which they happened. 
And a lot of that is not only to, if we're going to pursue this particular case moving forward, but it's also to help us to make sure that the organization can maintain its duty of care to others. When others believe that they cannot tell the story of the survivor, so they don't want to report what happened when the survivor has reported it to them. It also comes into play when the survivor either initially says, yes, I want to to participate and then decides not to or says, this is what happened, but I'm not, I don't want to engage in an investigative process. While we give them that agency that they don't want to pursue this, we have to gather as much information as we possibly can. Just because we cannot take disciplinary action because there has not been an investigation doesn't mean that there aren't other steps that we can take. And even when there aren't any steps we can take right now, just by collecting that evidence, when the alleged perpetrator strikes again, we have the opportunity to come back to that survivor and say, would you like to pursue this now? There's more than one of you. We have the opportunity, hopefully before that happens, to provide some or recommend that training be be provided, coaching, making sure that conversations in offices are open, that there are clear lines of communication, and that everyone knows that they have the opportunity and the right to report anything that they consider inappropriate at any time. Those are the ways in which we ensure that WHO doesn't become the victim. Right. So it goes back to the mandatory reporting for a bystander who is witnessing or hears this. We really emphasize the mandatory reporting to everyone. We've received you know, feedback where mandatory reporting goes against victim and survivor-centered approach. You know, the 10th Ebola outbreak plunged WHO into its darkest hour Mm -hmm. and unfortunately overshadowed the good work that so many people are are doing. I would encourage those who are still within the WHO workforce to continue doing the good work, but to be vigilant about misconduct of any type, but particularly taking advantage of the most vulnerable people and exerting a bit of what I would call social control. So it's not enough for me to be responsible for my own behavior and to be upstanding and uh, and uphold the, the WHO code of conduct and what I would call the rules of basic human dignity and respect. But it's also important for me to keep an eye out for my my fellow colleagues. And if there's something that I'm seeing that is not right, doesn't feel right, doesn't smell right, doesn't look right, to address it head on. You know, we often talk about, and I think you mentioned earlier in this podcast about removing the taboos. And the elephant in the room really begins with the things, with the micro behaviors and the microaggressions and the small levels of disrespect and the the objectification in the smallest ways of people and the smallest ways in which we take liberties that don't belong to us. It's important, as important for us to be as vigilant for ourselves as we are with and for our colleagues. And by exerting that level of social control with and for one another, we can put this behind us by improving our culture to a place in which mutual respect is not only inspected and expected, but it simply exists in all areas, all corners, you know, in, in every element of what we do. Thanks, Lisa. I think that that's basically the translation of a, a zero tolerance. And maybe to end on a personal note, how does being a female leader and one of color shape your approach and perspective in leading a historically, let's say, male dominant profession. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for that that question. Coming up in law enforcement, particularly in law enforcement in the U.S., I cut my teeth in a what I would call male dominant environment. I think that there are many 
what I would call gender expectations, particularly when it comes to, to leadership that I am always mindful of. And the way in which I move forward with that is remain mindful of them, never give up who I am, always be who I am first and foremost, but to remember that in a leadership position, leading is about influencing human behavior. We're all here with the expectation to add to the sum total of humanity. So as we influence human behavior, what are we giving? What am I giving to the people who are coming in behind me? Because rest assured that if no one is following by default, I'm not leading. So if I want to maintain my leadership qualities, yes, I have to be to technically sound. Yes, I have to generally know where what what I'm doing. I have to be willing to admit when I don't know what I, I'm doing and not just pretend that I do know what I'm doing. But I have to be compassionate with people and I have to let them know that I care. And I think that with WHO coming out of its darkest day, having empathy and leadership, having people who are not just passionate about what they're doing, but also show the people around them that they care are the, the types of things that will will allow WHO to move towards its its potential for greatness. There is, with women being 50% of the population and with the mandate of the organization being a healthcare or health for, for all, better health for all, if women don't occupy 50% of the seats around the table, we will never make it to where we want to be. That's how the mic drops. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think you you it was a very inspirational and, and powerful statement, especially for women who are entering the workforce, women who are in the workforce, but also for men to to understand that there are these qualities of female leadership that is to be embraced as well. So thank you for your time and and for your words and your leadership. Thank you so much, Guni. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate so much the work that the Department for Prevention and Response to Sexual Misconduct is doing. You are an integral part of our overall accountability and the communication around the work that we're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the World Health Organization's Hashtag No Excuse podcast. We hope we've given you another perspective on preventing and responding to sexual misconduct in the humanitarian and development sectors. We release new episodes every two weeks. But if you have any feedback, questions or suggestions in the meantime, feel free to reach out at prseah at who.int. Until the next time, goodbye.